Coming up, the Bird Family discovers thousands of shrimp, hundreds of fish, and dozens of rays in the Azores. Welcome to Jonathan Bird's Blue World. The isolated islands of the Azores rise from the great depths of the Atlantic Ocean to peaks surpassing 2,000 meters above sea level. Located way out in the Atlantic, the Azores archipelago consists of nine islands, each a former volcano growing at the intersection of three tectonic plates. The archipelago is part of Portugal, the closest major land mass, 1,400 kilometers to the east. The Bird family has spent a week traveling around the eastern Azores on a liveaboard dive vessel called Water and Wind. We began by visiting sites around the big island of Sao Miguel. Then we headed offshore on a mission to dive the remote Formigas Islets, not much more than some rocks and a lighthouse. There, we made some new friends. A few mobile arrays followed the boat for a while, and on our dives, we met a friendly grouper. And some aggressive triggerfish. But now we're off on our final leg of the trip with Captain Carlos at the helm. Under wind power, we're sailing south across the blue world. A fin whale makes a brief appearance, unperturbed by our silent vessel. After a four hour crossing from the Formigas, we arrive at the lovely Santa Maria Island, sailing into Sao Lorenco Bay. Santa Maria is the southernmost island of the Azores. This rural green community is known for its warm, dry weather, steep terrace farming, and beautiful beaches. On the eastern side of the island stands a magnificent waterfall called Aviero. And on the western, in stark contrast, a unique clay formation known as the Red Desert. But of course, beautiful clear blue water surrounds the whole thing. And that's why we're here. The Bird family hits the water on our first dive in Santa Maria, and we can hardly wait to see what's below. Liam eagerly chases dive master Mateo, who promised us some pretty spectacular swim throughs. On the rocks at about 50 feet, I find some of the most colorful stuff I've seen yet. Orange cup corals. They tend to be more active at night, feeding on plankton, but I'm lucky there's a patch of them with their tentacles extended. Under ambient light, a scorpion fish has pretty good camouflage, but under my camera lights, it stands out like a sore thumb. Then we follow Mateo into a swim through. In these places, water movement has flushed the sand out from under huge rocks and created tunnels we can swim through, hence the name. And swimming through is really fun. Some of these tunnels can be quite huge.
Mateo directs us into one of his favorites. This one is long enough that it almost feels like cave diving, and that's always fun to me. But even though these feel like caves, they're technically caverns because we can always see the light of day. In a back corner, Mateo finds what he was looking for and points our attention to it. As I poke my head in for a look, I notice that the shadows are moving. Shrimp. But as I look around the next corner, I realize there are thousands of them. This species is rare to see in such shallow water. These are narwhal shrimp, so named because they have a long pointy rostrum on the front of their head that looks like a narwhal's tusk. These light-avoiding crustaceans are normally found in darkness below 100 meters. But here they are, hiding in a dark cavern at only 15 meters. As I move my camera in closer, they bunch together to escape my lights. I notice that many of the females are carrying blue bundles of eggs. Each one has about a thousand tiny eggs on her swimmerettes. And I'm surrounded by thousands of egg-laden shrimp. That's a lot of eggs. A fish known as a fork beard is gorging itself on the shrimp. This fish, also normally found deeper than 100 meters, has followed its prey into shallower water. The shrimp are happy to hang out with Liam since he doesn't have a light and protects them from the forkbeard fish. Not far away on the sand, another darkness-seeking crustacean, a hermit crab. And on the wall of the tunnel, a Mediterranean slipper lobster. Its main predator is triggerfish, of which there are many in the Azores. So these guys hide from triggerfish in the tunnels during the day and go out to feed at night when the triggerfish are sleeping. Soon we finish our tunnel traverse and head back out the other side. As we ascend to our safety stop, a triggerfish comes over to investigate. I'm pretty sure he knows that we're protecting the location of the slipper lobsters. No matter how many times he threatens us, we aren't talking. Once our safety stop is complete, we head back to the boat. That was Liam's first cavern dive, and it was pretty awesome. There were rivers of shrimp in this cave off to the side. Amazing oh, and scary at the same time. While we have a little lunch, Captain Carlos moves the boat to another site. And Mateo gives us a dive briefing. So this dive is interesting because as I was telling you yesterday, we would see like different uh, rock formation. I change the battery in my camera and then it's time to suit up. Oh yeah. I am ready. 
<laughs> There's a little bit of current as we make our way along the underwater topography. We find a submerged mountain of basalt, rocks formed from cooled lava into polyhedron rods of varying lengths. It looks like a crazy funhouse staircase covered in colorful algae. Christine thinks it's a good place to sit down and contemplate life with a nice view of a swimming pool. The cause of these random giant holes in the rock is a bit of a mystery. Rising up a little shallower for a better view, I get a great shot of the overall alien landscape. Closer to shore, there are areas in the rock that look like underwater bathtubs. These were in fact formed thousands of years ago when sea levels were lower. The ocean surf tossed the boulders back and forth in these depressions, scouring them deeper and deeper into pools. Now 10 meters underwater, all the sloshing has stopped and the formations frozen in time. Whether wind or water eroded these rocks is hard to tell. Although I'm fascinated by the geology of the area, I don't want to miss out on the marine life. A moray eel pokes out from her den to say hello. Some people think that morays open their mouths wide as a warning. But over many years, I have learned that this is not true. In fact, it is a sign of boredom. Underwater cinematographers are boring. As I look around for my next subject, I notice something out in the blue and I make a beeline to investigate. It's a nice big school of white Trevally jacks found all over the world in tropical waters. These guys definitely like underwater cinematographers. Instead of being bored with me, they form a parade in front of my lens as if to show off their formation swimming. As the school of fish passes by, something blocks out the sun for a second. I look up to see a shoal of mobulas dancing above me. I slowly make my way up to them and at 20 feet join the school. I might be the new kid in class, but they seem to be a very welcoming bunch. A mobula is basically a smaller version of a manta, but this particular mobula, known as the sickle fin devil ray, has a unique trait. They're the only known ray that migrates back and forth from shallow to extremely deep water regularly to feed. They dive multiple times per day more than a mile deep into the freezing cold darkness to find their favorite plankton. But it's too cold for them to live down there, so they return to shallow water to warm up for a few hours between deep dives. And when they're warming up, they can be quite curious. This particular spot lies at the top of a deep drop-off, so lots of devil rays often come here. Many of the devil rays carry hitchhikers. Remoras that hang on for a free ride with a suction cup. The rays have abrasions on their heads and near the back of their body where the remoras like to attach themselves. 
The remoras do eat parasites and serve a purpose for the rays, but they still seem like a painful annoyance. Hanging on the mooring line gives me a rest from the current. And like a runner on a treadmill, the devil rays can swim in place, keeping water going through their gills and having a good look at the silly human on a rope. You can see why they're called devil rays. Their cephalic lobes, which can be uncurled into scoops for feeding, look like a devil's horns. But I can assure you they are anything but demonic. These animals are among the gentlest creatures in the ocean. And many researchers think they are among the most intelligent of all the fish because of how much natural curiosity they exhibit. I mean, let's face it, it's pretty obvious that they're curious about me. Another cool fish that loves cinematographers. They really like the warm water right up at the very surface, but filming up here in the waves makes it hard to hold the camera still. We stay with the devil rays until our camera batteries croak, and then retire to the boat. What a day of diving! Santa Maria is an absolute treasure. A beautiful island surrounded by clear blue water teeming with life. And while our liveaboard dive adventure with water and wind may be coming to an end, we realize that we still have seven more islands to visit in the Azores. So we will definitely be back to this diver's paradise and true gem of the blue world. Hey guys, if you want to learn more about diving in Portugal, check out PortugalDive.com. They're the Portugal diving experts.